to uh, the last of our Sparking Conversations and Educational Leadership Webinars for the year. I'm Sean Slade. I'm one of the two co-heads of education at BTS Spark. Uh, BTS Spark is a not-for-profit practice focusing on educational leadership development. And our other co-head, Alyssa Gallagher, is, um, should be on the chat box as well, so you can interact with her um, via the chat box. Um, welcome to um, our webinars. As I probably have mentioned previously, we've been doing these for about six months now and have had some really interesting guests, including people like Michael Fullen and Michelle Borber, um, Andy Hargraves, Jason Glass from Kentucky. It's been a real interesting journey so far. Each of these webinars is hosted on Zoom, which I'm sure by now, after 18 months to two years, you're all professional experts at having to deal with and uh, fiddle with Zoom. But if you're not, you can adjust the screen size and customize it so you can see either majority PowerPoint or majority speakers. So if you go up to the top tab and click, it allows you to drag it along. So you can actually, I can't control it from here, but you can control it from your end. All of these webinars do get recorded and then they're uploaded with, typically within 24 hours to our YouTube page, um, BTS Spark YouTube, and you'll be receiving an email to outline when it's up and where that location is as well. Um, as I mentioned, the list will be on the chat box, so please feel free to mention who you are, where you're from, what your role is, and also ask any questions. And we will have time at the end for a Q&A. So if you do have questions, don't feel that you need to leave it until the last minute. Enter your questions into the um, Q&A box and I'll try and get to it towards the end. Um, what typically happens though with these uh, webinars and presentations is the discussion goes on and we sometimes don't even get through the, the planned questions and I have a feeling this one could be pretty similar. So we're here discussing personal resilience, not only that it's needed for our students, but that it's also needed for our educators and school leaders. And as we've done with each of these webinars, I want to introduce why we've chosen this topic and why we've chosen this theme. And we put an article out in EdSurge last week, myself and Alyssa, that sort of outlines the, the rationale behind it. Um, I, and also Sarah Truebridge, one of our panelists, worked closely with Bonnie Bernard, the renowned resilience researcher back in the early 2000s. And Bonnie was one of the, the leading people to talk about protective factors in the environment. And she really highlighted how these protective factors can be broken up into caring relationships, meaningful participation, and high expectations. And what the research or what the study had often looked at was these protective factors um, with regards to students. But these same protective factors apply just as much to adults, even though we sometimes ignore or forget or bypass the need to focus on the same um, experiences and the same protective factors for our educators. And these factors are developed via the, the interactions and the relationships that we have in our uh, places of work, in our home life, or in our work life as well. And so when we're talking about these three um, protective factors of caring relationships, meaningful participation and high expectations, I want you to think to yourself about how often do you currently experience those in your current place of work, your current work life? I know that years ago when I was talking to Bonnie and we were talking about um, these three elements, and I'll say, you know, if, if I went to work and I didn't believe that the people I worked with cared about me as a person, if I didn't believe that what I did had meaning, and if I didn't believe the people I worked for had high expectations of the work that I could produce, I'd probably get up and walk out and find a new role. But it's amazing how often we don't ask 
ourselves if we're cared about, if what we do is meaningful, and if we're expected to actually develop and create things um, of high worth. Now, Bonnie, in her book, Student Resilience, What We Have Learned, talked about how there's also these internal assets. Now, they can be described as a set of traits, although I think Sarah Truebridge might push back against that, and they're more that a set of um, skills and elements that can be learned over time and improved upon. But I'll certainly hope that Sarah can chime in about that. But there are these internal assets that we can develop, things around autonomy, social competence, meaning and purpose. And when you look at some of the skills that make up those internal assets, they're very often some of the things that we're trying to get our students to develop and that we want people to develop as they enter society. And these internal assets are actually fostered or get developed when we have these conditions from the external protective factors that allow them to grow and allow them to be developed. So what we're striving for really is caring, supportive environments inside our schools, which are based on relationships, but also then the development of these individual skills, traits, competencies, including collaboration, empathy, sense of self and purpose. And I suppose it's probably not really a coincidence that when you look at leadership skills from either a class leader or a school leader or a superintendent, very often these are the same skills that we're looking at developing. These skills, they can be taught and they can be developed. We can help make our school environments more connected and supportive. And so really what we're looking at today is how can we support school leaders to embrace new leadership mindsets? How can we support them to develop these skills around their own personal resilience and as a consequence, our collective resilience? And I think we're gonna have a, a fun discussion as well because we've um, brought together a, a fun group of panelists Jessica Cabine has just recently um, been awarded the K-12 Dive Principal of the Year for 2021. Congratulations, Jessica. Um, and she's currently the principal of Ellis Middle School in Austin, Minnesota. I can go through the list, but she's a, um, a Minnesota National Distinguished Principal in 2017, a National Association of Elementary School Principals, uh, middle level fellow, um, author of... Uh, one of the hacking learning books from Times 10, um, as well as uh, Leading with Grace, which I think we'll get into a little bit later in the soft skills of leadership. So welcome, welcome, Jessica. We also have my uh, friend and former colleague, uh, Sarah Truebridge. Sarah and I worked together with Bonnie Bernard um, in West End in the Bay Area in the early 2000s. Sarah is the founder of Educating the New Humanity. She's a researcher, a TED Talk presenter, educator. The list goes on um, primarily around resilience. Um, and she's been combining her experience and expertise in the areas of research, policy, and practice to promote success and equity for all. Um, her latest book is Resilience Begins with Beliefs. And she's also a faculty member of the Educational Leadership Doctoral Program at Southern New Hampshire University. So welcome, Sarah. And last but not least, we have Tom Hur. Um, Tom also has a new book out, which is uh, via ASCD. The principal is Chief Empathy Officer. And Tom and I knew each other during uh, our combined work at ASCD. And he's been uh, um, in education for over 37 years and is currently a scholar in residence at University of Missouri, St. Louis, teaching in the educational leadership program. As you can read, an author of a number of books and frequently writes for ASCD educational leadership as well. And we'll see if we can get Tom's camera working. I don't see it just yet, Tom. Hey, yeah, well, I'm happy, happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Well done. And Tom, for some reason, I don't know why, but he's normally the purveyor of really interesting, fun ties. But today, um, he's decided to be more festive and is wearing red. Anyway, welcome everybody.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean and Alyssa. Thank All you. right, I'm going to jump into it now. Um, and this is the only time you get to speak on your own without anybody interrupting. So we do this so we can hear from everybody. And what we're going to do is ask you a quick question about what does this phrase mean to you? And the phrase is that the title, Personal Resilience, as needed for our educators, as it is for our students. And feel free to pick apart um, any word in this. You're going to have a minute and you can see by the slide that I put up, it'll change color to tactfully show you when your minute is up. So, um, Tom, I'm going to leave it over to you to start with to um, tell us what this phrase means to you. Well, I think it is really important, and, and I'm going to jump away from resilience for a second and just say social-emotional learning is the big term. We're talking about it now. Howard Gardner uh, got us looking at that with the personal intelligences. Daniel Goleman picked it up, and to me, what I've been saying is if we really want to develop SEL in our students, if we really want to develop character, we have to do it first with the educators. We can't leapfrog the teachers, and so this is an, an example of it, I think, that is really, really firm. Uh, if you want to develop resilience in students, and we do, uh, the world has never been crazier than it is now, we also need to develop that with our faculty, with our teachers. And to me, the two keys there are intentionality and transparency. The intentionality is pretty clear. We're, we're all here today, so clearly we all believe it. We all want to pursue this. But to me, I think transparency is really what needs to be given a lot more attention and a lot more thought. I led schools despite my youthful appearance for 37 years. And one of the things I learned uh, later rather than sooner was that the clearer I was about what we were doing, why we were doing it, what I thought, the easier it was for people to get on board or to disagree with me. So I think the, the intentionality and the transparency is, is cre critical, key, because we need to develop these qualities in our teachers if we are A, to develop them in our students, and B, if our teachers are to make it through the school year. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. And we're going to turn it over now to Sarah. You have uh, your one minute, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Alyssa. I also want to do a shout out to the folks from my resilience chat and SNU. Um, First of all, I just want to say that resilience, as Tom said, it's taking care of the caretakers, what we're talking about today. And what it means to me is, and Sean, you'll recall this from Bonnie, it's not what we do, but how we do it. And it's about having a mindset and an understanding that we need to take care of ourselves not only take care of ourselves, but also be part of the community that supports the environmental factors that support other people in their resilience. And I think so much of uh, resilience is understanding, and I'm going to refer to what you talked about, Sean, that it's a process and not a trait. Because if, in fact, we were to think of it as a trait, we'd say, you have it, you have it. Oh, you don't. Traits are things people have or don't have. Whereas resilience, everybody has the capacity for resilience. It's a matter of whether or not it's been tapped. Well said. Thank you very much, Sarah. And last but not least, Jessica, you have the floor. Yeah, well, and it's just a real true honor to be uh, just kind of pinching myself here in Minnesota um, to be on this panel and just hear from these um, Sarah and Tom and you, Sean. And I think um, just to kind of keep going with that, um, as a school principal, um, my, I feel like my role is, since I'm not directly taking care of the students, my job is to take care of the people taking care of the students. But even before that, I need to take care of myself so I have the capacity to take care of the people that take care of the students. So um, to be very transparent, when we went into full um, shutdown, lockdown two years ago, I knew I couldn't sustain with, with the pace and what I was trying to do. And so I really tried to dive more into that resiliency and learn more about the research behind it. And coming out of it, I think authenticity and vulnerability are key. Um, only you can do what you can do. And I know so many teachers through the pandemic, their agency shifted a little bit. 
who they are and what they do has changed through the pandemic. And as we move forward, you know, being vulnerable with what I've always done and how I've always served might have to look different to meet the needs of our learners today, moving forward to tomorrow. So being vulnerable with maybe I don't have all the answers anymore and being authentic and how we're, how we're tackling this, I think is going to be key in continuing to be able to thrive through this pandemic and moving forward to serve our students. Wonderful. It leads, it leads on exactly to what we've been talking about throughout all of these six months of webinars, really how leadership is becoming more of a human endeavor. Education is a human um, practice, but Sean, leadership Sean, too often... Sean, let, let me interrupt if I can. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is where you are is wonderful. But I heard Jessica talking about taking care of herself. And my first reaction was, wow, wh what did you do? So if you can... Give us just a sidebar because I'm I need it. We all need it. Tell us what that is and then and then back to Sean. Tom just takes over. I love it. Um okay, so is that all right, Sean? If I just of go back. Course. Okay. All right. So um for me as a school leader, like really getting grounded in my calling and really then setting goals for myself, learning to say no and really sticking tight to the three cornerstones for our building and everything else has to go. Setting boundaries with technology is a huge piece for me. Um, this is true gray hair. And so learning how to navigate technology as an adult learner was a challenge. So learning to shut off my phone at night, turning email off, setting boundaries between um, communication. Because just because it's on 24 seven doesn't mean we have to be on it as well. Um, continuing to find self-care and soul care. So taking care of myself, eating, getting up and walking, um, trying to stay in relation, healthy relationships with my family. Um, and then soul care, just like, why do I get up every day and pull into this parking lot? And am I doing the best I can to serve that? And I think to be really transparent, like I've sought mental health support for myself through this pandemic and I continue to. And I, I think as leaders and as educators, we can't be afraid or ashamed for our own mental health and wellness. And I think sharing that, that with others just makes it less of a stigma and more of a support. So Hopefully those were kind of helpful tidbits and I continue to learn from this and, and try to continue to be better for myself so I can serve. And then finally, I came to our back to school meeting saying, I care about you as a person first before your position. And you have to be super, super transparent because you can say it in August, but you're going to have to revisit it in November when a teacher's coming in coughing up a lung because they can't find a sub. Go home. I care about you as a person before your position. We will cover your classroom, but I only get you and I need you healthy. But I think we need to really have the personal side of this um, on the forefront. And that sometimes means we have to make hard decisions to cover things or to do things differently. But if we don't value our person, who we are as a person before our position, it's gonna really just diminish the work we're trying to do. I, yeah, I think I think you I think you tapped on so many good points there. We could almost end the webinar right now, Jessica. <laughs> to be honest, we're talking about um, uh, mm -hmm. self and soul care, I think is a really great little tweetable phrase as well. Besides being meaningful, about setting boundaries, about about being vulnerable as well, and that that is one thing that has come through in the last couple of months. Whenever we've done these webinars, is it, it is a human endeavor, and I think. If there is one benefit about the pandemic, I think it's allowed people to, to re-look at what we do in education and see that it's not a scripted curriculum and we're actually teaching um, individuals, people, and the teachers are people as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce this question, but please feel free to take the conversation from what Jessica said. Um, but the question I wanted to start with was basically, and I took this quote, um, from Bonnie, um, and I want to understand from your perspective why resilience is key, and you can answer that in terms of students and or in terms of adults. I, can I just jump in here? <laughs> like you said, freewheeling here. Um, one of the things I want to pick up on with what Jessica also said is almost before we go, go further, I guess this might be the researcher in me, that I really want to make a distinction between what resilience as a definition is and then what self-care is. Because we often, self-care is a strategy for resilience. Resilience in a nutshell 
is the ability to bounce back, adapt from adversity, stress, trauma, everyday obstacles. And the self-care becomes the important um, aspect and strategy to support resilience. So I just wanted to make that distinction. And the only other thing right now that I want to just say is that resilience isn't just finding it within ourselves. It's also, and this is where leadership comes in, it's creating the environments that support resilience. We never want to blame the victim, the person like you can't can't get to your resilience. It's you, you, you. You need the environments that also support resilience, just as Jessica, what you mentioned in your school, the, the ability to be transparent and everything. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me jump in here. And Jessica, as Sean said, we could end right now with what you said. But the key is that we all need to take care of, uh, of our colleagues. And that's true regardless of, of your role. There's a great study that Google did years ago in looking at what makes an effective problem solving group. And one of their, their key findings was that in an effective group, it's not just the leader who takes ownership of the group, everybody does. Everybody who's in the group feels responsible for the group's success. So that might mean that if Sean's not saying something, even though I'm not in charge, I say, Sean, hold on a second, what do you think? Well, likewise, if you play that out, what it means is we all need to take care of one another. As a school leader, absolutely, that's my job, and I need to do it again uh, with intentionality and transparency. But I need to create a culture where everybody looks out for everybody else, and I remind people that we're all on the same team. One of my, my phrases I used a lot was make new mistakes, because I want to encourage people to feel comfortable in trying new things and learning from their experience. I can say that a whole lot, but it's really effective when staff members are saying to one another, hey, I made a new mistake today, let me tell you what I did, or good for you, you made a new mistake. Getting that, that ethos of care to permeate the environment, it can come from the leader, but we all have to embrace it. You know, Tom, you're saying something, you know, really important about, um, we all need to really embrace that and the whole concept of failing. And, you know, as educators, we've heard people say first attempt in learning. That's what F-A-I-L really means. Right. And so I really agree with you. The other word that I want to put out there is I talk in terms of co-creating that it's not just creating, but it's co-creating with everybody, that we all have a responsibility. And it's uh, the leadership giving the opportunity to invite other um, voices in to help co-create. Yeah, and just to touch on what you've both been saying as well, I, I agree 100%. And it's everything that we espouse at BTS Spark as well, that it takes the lead, but it, that you need people to, to take up that leadership role and take some onus, ownership and agency. However, and Jessica, I'm gonna bring you in here. However, it takes the skill of a leader to actually allow that to happen. And so you have to have a leader who is purposeful and conscientious enough to give um, the space for those things to be created. And I'm wondering, Jessica, if you can outline a couple of things that perhaps you did at the start of the school year to make sure that your um, staff and faculty felt cared for and respected. Well, of course, of course. And I, Sarah, I just need you to know, like, these are all the notes I've taken thus far. <laughs> <laughs> And Tom knows I, I stalk him at ASCD events um, for clarity with, with goal setting. So he, he is already trying to hide from me <laughs> in public spaces. But um, so, so at the beginning of the year, like that vulnerability, like we took a risk with our building calendar. We moved to a block schedule this year from a seven period day. And we started that work last November. We did a lot of focus groups. We did professional development around um, brain-based learning, brain breaks and the importance of how do we instill that in our students. We brought in training um, at the beginning of the year. It was like our one thing. 
And that's what we continue to, to focus on during the year. My walkthroughs are all about brain breaks. We model brain breaks with our own professional development. Um, so continuing to just make sure that it's not another thing, but the one thing that's going to drive our school forward. But also with that schedule is we tried to create this Wednesday flex day. And three weeks into it, that thing was a disaster. Like kids weren't getting lunch. Teachers were crying. Principals were crying. I finally had to come in front of the staff and say, well, I really screwed that up. Like, this isn't going to work. And I'm going to have to pivot and do something different. And the amount of staff that came to me and said, hey, it's okay. Like, don't beat yourself up too much. But I'm like, if I make a mistake that impacts 850 kids in 2000 families, you can make a mistake that impacts 30 kids in a classroom. Like, like to be that vulnerable to say, hey, we wanted to try this. Our intention was to give kids flexible learning and some additional study groups and extracurricular things. It just didn't work. So I think as a leader modeling these skills and again, bouncing back from adversity, I mean, like, oh, I didn't want to get on Facebook for about two weeks after that whole disaster. But I think it's just like, we can do this. Like we, we tried something with the best intentions and it didn't work, but we're going to learn from it and move forward. Yeah, it's fantastic. You, I'm going to send you an article that we put out at BTS a couple, uh, last year called Messy Leadership. And a lot of what you're talking about is around the same thing. And it's really about being vulnerable, being human, um, being not afraid to admit mistakes and letting people understand, as Tom was saying, that that's part of the learning process. Mm-hmm. And if the leader starts to even model it, it all of a sudden, it has credibility and you can start to do it in that school environment. I'm going to move us on a little bit um, because we do have some questions to get through. And I suppose the biggest question that I think most people are going to have when they start to think about um, enhancing or developing um, resilience in their school and with their educators is, is where do I start? And so we talked about the external protective factors, the caring relationship, the meaningful participation, the high expectations. And we also outline some internal assets as well, the social competence, the autonomy, sense of purpose. Um, So I'm throwing the question out there about where would one start around this? Is there there something linear we should look at? Um, Is there one that starts before the other? I can I I can jump in here. Um, the, the, there is consistency over and over in the research that the number one protective factor is caring relationships. That is over and over and over again. And one of the things I always say to uh, teachers and to educators, and we know this. Kids know when you're authentic and sincere. Even kindergartners know when you're BSing them. (laughs) And so one of the issues with caring relationships is they have to be authentic, sincere, and come from the heart. And so when it comes to the external protective factors, I would go and really emphasize the caring relationships. And then we can talk about the internal ones because of course I have an opinion on that one as well, but I'll stop there with the um, external ones talking about the caring relationships. That's the, and, and we can talk about what do those look like? What are caring relationships? What do they look like? So I'll jump in then uh, agreeing with that. And I would say they're not linear, semicolon, however, comma, caring comes first. Sarah's right. And when we talk about the intentionality, um, in in my work now at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, I'm teaching lots of prospective school administrators, some current school administrators working on doctorates. And the one key factor, I think, that determines whether or not we can really execute this is not intention. I think everybody wants to care about people. It's whether they're able to develop the time. And the one thing principals do not have is time. I mean, Jessica, God love her. If she can make it through this session without getting interrupted, uh, my hat is off to her. Uh, So principals don't have enough time. And 
caring takes time. You have to listen. You've got to spend time. You can't delegate it. Uh, once I, I, when I became a new principal, I was reminded of, of a small town mayor. People came in and they had issues with me. And one of the things I learned is even though I thought I knew what the issue was after 30 seconds, they weren't ready for the answer yet. Even if it was the right answer, it often wasn't. That's a different story. But what I needed to do was give them the time, yeah. validate them. And, and when we talk about caring relationships, principals need to say, this is my number one priority. And not only am I going to say it, I'm going to allocate the time to it. That's going to be reflected in my daily schedule. I'm going to mark time off when I visit classrooms, when I hang out in the teacher's lounge. And I'm also going to develop a big piece of time in our PD session. It's not just that we hear from an expert, from Tom, her, or or whomever, it's that we take time to take care of ourselves. You know, uh, Tom, I want to build on something that you just mentioned, and that is the issue of time. I, I, I have facilitated, like since 2014, a resilience chat on Twitter, and the subject that we were talking about was time. And that is our precious resource and commodity. And so when you talk about time, I, I'm right there with you. Um, I just want to say one thing that, you know, I saw in the chat, what do caring relationships even look like? And we throw out words like compassion, being there, listening. And I invite, when I work with educators, I say, unpeel the onion, go deeper. What does it look like? What does being there actually look like? Or what does listening look like? So that we have specific actions and activities to associate with caring relationships. Maybe I'll just, I'll tap into some of the, the practical ways that I, that we try to do this. Um, one thing though, too, I think as a strength finders, I'm very disciplined, which means I like time bound and rituals and probably not the best, um, like love language, like for me to, to, to show caring sometimes looks different um, just because a, a campus of over eight, 80 staff, you know, that, that time is, is precious and valuable. So I think one thing that I've really learned is to be intentional with my time and be present in my mind. And so for me, that's um, like when I'm out in the halls, I'm not on my phone. Like if I'm talking with staff or I'm in the lunchroom, I really, I leave my phone in my office and I set certain times I'm checking email or whatever. Um, and then I, I laugh because this is so kindergarten -y, but I have this little like spreadsheet here <laughs> and I'm so sorry if this is silly but it's got all of the staff members names on it and I keep it by quarter so like today I went and looked and I'm like oh my gosh I haven't been in this teacher's classroom in the last three weeks I mean things go you think you have been but you don't collect that data so I highlight the classrooms I visited I make note of when I send up like a positive card home to a family member and then I also keep track of like how many student events I've been to, how many classroom visits I'm doing. It's for me just helps me see like, is my time really where it needs to be? And sometimes I just need to collect that data. And sometimes it's worth just celebrating like, oh my gosh, we were down three teachers, but I was still able to catch a couple teachers classrooms or I subbed in a classroom. So it helps me to reflect on like, am I making sure that I'm spending the time in the right spaces and, and being intentional with that? It's, it's wonderful. There's a, all of us have our sort of favorite phrases and quotes from, you know, experts out there and authors. Um, one of mine is uh, James Comer, who said that in every interaction, you are either building community or breaking it down. And so if you think about it that way, that every time you interact with either a student or with a, um, a staff member or a community member, it's either gonna build up the community or it's gonna break it down depending on how you interact. You're not changing the amount of time, you're changing how these people are receiving what we're doing. So we're gonna, and you've sort of preempted this, Jessica. Um, and what I wanna find out is we, we can either talk about the caring relationships um, and how we actually start to develop that, or if you want to pick some other areas and give an example about how you might start to think about developing that, particularly with your um, educators um, and teachers, um, that would be great. One that comes to mind, Sarah, was if you remember what you did, I think it was Bunch Middle School 
in Oakland mm -hmm. and putting the students' names up oh, on the yeah. board, I think is a lovely example. But when, uh, I can, I can talk stuff. about that, what, what that was. Um, this was a real practical activity that I did um, where I was doing an in-service for a whole school. And prior to going to the school, I asked the principal, make a list of every single child in the school and let's put it around the room. So I had all these educators in the room for the day. And then I had this list with children's students' names on them. And I gave every teacher these, you know, these little mini sticky dots that they can have. So I said during the day, the whole day, you can get up anytime. And I want you to put a sticky dot next to a child, any child all the children that you have relationships with. And I defined a relationship as being able to ask, how was your weekend? How's your mind? You know, something more than just how, how are you? It's someone that you know. So during the day, they put up all these dots and people were walking around. The, this actually was with a middle school. So it was with sixth, seventh and eighth graders. At the end of the day, there were some kids that had just everybody put sticky dots. There were hundreds, you know, because we had a big staff. Then there were kids in eighth grade who didn't even have his sticky dots. So, you know, they've been there at sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. There wasn't one sticky dot, meaning no educator had made a connection. So what we did, fast forward, we put together an action plan where the principal took every student that had three dots or less, put them in groups of five, gave them to teachers, whether you knew them or not, and said, you will establish relationships. And then every staff meeting, they gave like 10 minutes at the staff meeting. So the teachers could share how to nurture those relationships. And um, it was, it was such a visual representation of caring relationships. I'm going to also put up um, to give you a little preempt as well of um, some things that I know the three of you have spoken about in terms of where to start and how to start. Um, Tom, you've talked about well, the title of your new book, The Principal is Chief Empathy Officer. Sarah, you've talked about educators' beliefs and um, changing mindset. And Jessica, you've talked about leading with grace by learning to let things go. So I wonder if any of you would like to take up the, the prompt here to talk about how we start to develop resilience with our teachers. I'm waiting for Jessica. Oh, geez. All <laughs> right, Tom. Gosh. Well, and Sarah, I was just, I was, yay. Cause we, we do very similar things here at the middle school. And so it was so neat to see that example. Um, Cause it is so important that, mm -hmm. that we make those relationships with our students and then it translates to, to our families too. Um, I, I always, my, my mantra with Grace is, um, Leading with grace is learning something new every day and forgiving yourself along the way. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of forgiveness that we have to give each other this year as we're learning um, just how to do school differently. I think if nothing else, we have to know that developing resiliency in our communities is essential. It's going to be so important as we move forward and, and support our students now and the ones we're going to get in five years and the ones that are going to the high school next year. It's just, it's so um important and I and I'm hopeful that people are starting to see that that we value that social emotional learning as much as academic. I know people have put lip service to it before the pandemic, but I continue to see more and more even webinars such as this that are just saying, no, we really do want to find practical application to make this happen. So I really feel like um, walking through this and is, is with the administrators here is it's okay to make mistakes. It really is. And it really, like um, Sarah kind of said, it peels the onion. It lets people really reveal a little bit more about you um, because they may only see you like in person once every two to three days. They may go to their classroom. You might be, you know, if you're in a larger campus, you might not see everybody every single day. And so um, 
being vulnerable with that and being authentic and just being yourself every single day is, is essential to build that trusting relationship. Yeah, and, and let, let me jump in and pick on, you know, my, my title for a second. I mean, we're talking about resiliency and that's key. But it seems to me that that endemic in that, if it's to work well, is we've got to have empathy. And, you know, empathy is really listening to other people. It's putting yourself in their, in their place. So the question is, okay, how can you do that? And one of the things about which I've been writing and I talk about in my new book is the importance of gratitude, uh, developing gratitude and learning empathy. And one of my suggestions is that if I was running my school again today, what I would do on a monthly basis is we would begin our meetings by talking about gratitude. And I would develop an ethos, if you will, where we took the time to thank one another. Uh, people work their tail off, they help one another, but we're all so busy, we don't take the time to, to commend that. And it seems to me, you can, you can put a practice in, you can talk to somebody ahead of time, where you can play gratitude tag, where Tom thanks Jessica for something, Jessica then turns around, she thanks um, Sarah, who then thanks Sean. Um, I've also talked about having stationary at the meeting, and when people come in, they grab an envelope and a piece of paper, and you say, for five minutes, we're not going to do anything. Take the time to write a thank you note to somebody, because what I really want my teachers doing is developing that, because if they develop that, that empathy, that's what's going to be the basis for all their interactions, including resiliency, and if they develop it, then they're going to be much more likely to develop it among their students. And I'm going to jump in because let's see, Tom, you took the first one. Jessica, you took the third one. I'll take the middle one <laughs> because uh, I'll talk about beliefs because um, one of my areas of research was and, and work that I did was how do we get educated? Re resilience begins with beliefs. Bonnie Bernard had this beautiful theory and its elegance was in the simplicity of the theory, as you know, Sean. And Bonnie would often say, and it's in my book too, but Bonnie would share that resilience begins with beliefs. And so my work built on hers and I started asking, how can we get educators to believe in students' resilience and to believe in their own resilience, if that's where it really begins? Because as Sean wrote here, and we know from research, whether we like it or not, our beliefs translate into our thoughts, our messages, our behaviors. And it's like goes into the whole thing about, you hear about how in a classroom, certain children are called on instead of others more frequently. And again, we don't realize, but it's true. Our beliefs are moving our actions and our messages, our language. So I am a real um, stickler that it begins with our own beliefs. Here's a, and it's what we would call a BTS spark. We would call it beliefs or mindset as well as changing, changing your mindset. It's like, for example, we talked, um, for the longest time, at least in you know sessions I went to, about how your teaching practice is different if you just consider that you are a teacher of children as opposed to a teacher of content or subject matter. The way you interact with those students is different. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to everybody here, um, and then I also want to reach out to people to enter some questions from the audience into the Q&A. My question, follow up question here is, can we develop resilience or a resilient environment in a school if we don't have a principal or a leader who believes it or who is demonstrating it? So it doesn't require the leadership role. Well, let, let, let me jump in there and I hate, I, I wish I could give you a different response. Um, Earlier, I talked about getting everybody to embrace it. 
But if, if you know, if you don't have the leader who who believes it, supports it, you know, nothing is impossible, but boy, it would really, really, really be difficult. That, you know, Sean, you, that is a great question. And, um, I just want to share that there's uh, an, some work that I'm doing with a group called Authentic Connections and Chris Hansen, who's actually on this call with her school. And um, what we're able to do is engage in some survey work around resilience. And then we have data that we can present. And again, it's another way of co-creating and giving voice. So even if you don't have a leader that may be embracing it all, um, I think, think good intentions. I think everybody wants to do well. And I think then it's incumbent to bring information forward. And so I, I am an eternal optimist. And I do think that even with a leader that may be hesitant or not understand it, that everybody's educable. Wonderful. Well, that sort of leads me into um, a very quick summary of what we do here at BTS Spark as well, where as many people probably are aware, we base our coaching work um, on these 33 mindsets or hexagons. And you won't be surprised to hear that we have one focused directly and deliberately on personal resilience. So this is the work that we do with school leaders and educators, really trying to change, as you were saying, Sarah, that mindset yeah. of the school leader. And then very often what it ends up bringing in are, are other mindsets about engaging others or in embracing change or looking at your values but it really comes down to without without that leader um, leading this as the culture or the climate of the school it's possible but very difficult for that school to move forward or to change or transform you know we often also say um, that if you want to transform an environment you must transform yourself yes. um, at the start we are, as always, running out of time. I'm going to skip over this question. And there is one a question from the audience. If there are any others, you may have a minute or two to jump in. But it sort of leads on from what we were just talking about, which is if you did want to either as a um, school leader or as a, an experienced educator want to start to grow or enhance resilience in your school, should you focus first on the students? Should you focus first on the teachers? Who would like to take that? I'll just give it a pra I'll give it a practical shot and then I'll let Sarah and Tom fix it for me. Again, <laughs> vulnerable leadership. I'm gonna go out first at like a 60% accuracy. I'm gonna let these two help me grow. Um, but I would say it's always really important to start with the adults first. Um, one example, and, I, and Tom has been just phenomenal in helping us with our grading and our life skills grades. We've separated our grades from our academic and life skills grades. And this year we took it a step further and created individual goals for each of our 850 students. But in order to do that, we did goal setting for all the adults first. And we did um, pre-workshop work in which all of us sat down, our, our grading leadership team facilitated what is a goal, what's important for a goal. We, we let people do either a personal or professional goal. The only requirement was is you need to have it posted and visible for your advisory class because as they're building their goals, they want to see yours. And it was really fun to watch the kids hold the adults accountable with how many sodas they had during the day, were they staying organized, you know, and I feel like that built a stronger goal culture for our schools because the adult was really invested in it. They practice the skills. Um, some of us are social emotional learning is a little bit easier for us and some of us it's more challenging. And so practicing it with trusting adults before you had to demonstrate it with the kids, I think built confidence in everybody and a deeper understanding of the why it was important that we were doing this and then given us strategies for how to get it done. I, I totally agree. I always used to say that when I was a classroom teacher, the night before the kids came, you know, I didn't sleep. I was up late. I was so nervous to get my new class. And then what I noticed when I was a principal, 
that first day of kids was, was, was fun. But what I was really nervous was the day, the night before the teachers came, because they were my class. And it's the same thing, exactly what, what Jessica's saying and Sarah said, and Sean said, it starts at the top. And we, the school leaders, need to follow our rhetoric with our actions. And that is give the time to our faculty and the care that we want them to give to their students. Absolutely. And the only thing I can't, you know, say anything more uh, to what Jessica and Tom and that, but I just want to, this is an overused analogy, but we hear it all the time in the area of resilience. It's the oxygen mask analogy that in order to help others, you know, when an airplane, you know, you, they say, put your oxygen mask on first. It's the same with resilience. In order to help others, you first have to help yourself. You can't give from an empty cup. You know, you can't give until you've given to yourself first. Yeah, and that's for teachers though. That's a, that's difficult very often because they very often like to give. You know, you give a you give a teacher a gift card. You give them some accolade. They they very often pass it off or they spend it on the teach on the students. And so for a for faculty to actually say we'll start to do this first, it makes logical sense, but there's, you're also battling that sort of gut feeling that, no, I'd rather give this, even if it's resilience, give this to the students first. And, and, and Sean, I, I just want to follow, I, I was just, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. Real quickly, what you're talking about, Sean, I just want to bring up another term that we can go into another time. But what you're talking about, Sean, of compassion fatigue. It's the concept we, you know, we care. Teachers care. They ha it's all about our hearts. We care about our students and compassion fatigue happens because we care. Mm -hmm. And then we have to figure out how do we deal with that issue, which is so prevalent right now, which ultimately can lead to burnout and attrition. But again, that's another subject, another time. But you, but I think it's important in what we're talking about, what you mentioned, Sean. Yeah, and, and let me add just quickly, tying it together, when we talk about leaders modeling, one of the things that I did is I would set goals every year and I would share those with the faculty. Um, I didn't share all of them, but I would share a lot of them. And then I would talk at the end of the year about how I had done. That set the stage for them to do that with their students. And again, when we talk about developing resilience, part of that is if you're achieving all your goals, you're not being aggressive enough. So how do you handle when you don't achieve them? How do you deal with that? We need to model that for our faculty so they can do that with their students. Yeah, it's modeling that behavior. And it's also developing that learning environment where everybody, including the teacher, is learning. Um, we have time for one other audience question, and then I'm going to turn to your individual um, actions. But there's a question in about how we assess resilience and how does a school leader know that their school needs resilience? I'm going to take a little bit off of Sarah's lead is with the defining, defining resilience, bouncing back from adversity. Um, here in Minnesota, we have teacher unions. And so um, I meet with my union rep every week. And the piece that I want to know is that we're taking care of the culture and the climate first before the contract. So if we're starting to nitpick little things on the contract, that means the culture and the climate in the building is not going well, which means we're struggling with the little minor things and our mindset's growing more fixed. So I think for me, that's a telling point is that if if I'm seeing a lot of building complaints or more frustration or more, you know, it's OK to have those those difficult conversations, but you'll, you know, the tone, you know, it's, it's, I think that's really important is that you're before it becomes a major with the adults, is it, is there minor things that are going on? Uh, and, you know, you, you say the, to a researcher, assess, right? And the buzzword. And, you know, yes, there are scales out there. There are uh, measurements out there that deal specifically with resilience. Um, there, like I mentioned, authentic connections goes in and we're, you know, I'm working with going in and giving resilience questionnaires and surveys to the parents, the faculty, and the students. 
And with that comes information, qualitative as well as quantitative, to talk about now what do we do? Now that we have this information. So there is a way of assessing it for sure. And again, that's a whole conferences are developed around discussing how is resilience assessed. So good question. Perhaps, um, Sarah, if you have an article or two um, that you've written or you'd like to cite that we can share with people, we'd be happy to do that via um, some of our emails that go out to audience members afterwards as well. Absolutely. I'd love to. It will do. Uh, we're going to uh, move it on now because, as always, we run out of time. So you've got well, we're going to give you one minute now to recommend some actions that people can take um, either tomorrow or next week to develop either their personal resilience as a leader or to enhance the resilience in their school setting. And Jessica, would you like to go first? Of course, yes. Um, first off, just thank you again. It's been just a true honor. I'm now in three pages of notes here from the, from listening and, and learning from all of you. So um, just, I guess, super practical from the person who's going to be dealing with more parent phone calls as soon as this gets over. And they know before the show it was a little crazy. Um, probably really for, for yourself first, like your the resiliency and bouncing back from things. It's been a challenging two years. And if you've been a leader um, through this, it's, you've learned a lot. So, so try to remember the things that you've accomplished, big or small, and write those down and really start to reflect on how you've grown as a leader through these, these challenging times. I think just really rebuilding your own resiliency first, so then you can model and share it with others is, is probably my biggest suggestion. There's a lot you've learned and, and please don't diminish that work, big or small. Um, you matter and the work you did matter too. Yeah, we would we would call it taking a strength based approach. So you look at the things that have succeeded. Exactly. Sarah. Thank you, Sean. And yes, uh, and Alyssa. And um, I'm just really thrilled to have shared this time with you, Tom and Jessica. So thank you. What what I would say is tap into an awareness of what gives you strength and what gives you hope and what gives you the sense of optimism to move forward and identify those things and be part of a community that also supports the resilience of others. And don't try to do everything, start small. We know that success breeds success. And so, I would say, again, it starts with beliefs. That's what can we do tomorrow? We can believe. You can believe in your resilience and the resilience of others. And I will end by saying it's all about really being authentic with your heart and leading with your heart and knowing why we all went into education and I would just say, believe in yourself and believe in others. Wonderful. And we'll give the last word to Tom. Well, the last word is good because I got to listen to two people who are smarter than I am. So I'm just going to repeat what they said. And that is ending on the positive. And if I was working in a school right now, uh, I would come away from this. And what I would do would be to convene a group of people to talk with this issue. Uh, I might put something in my bullet and it said, hey, I heard this interesting session on resilience. Who'd like to meet with me after school? Who'd like to meet for school? Because what I want to do is begin spreading it. I want to establish a support group. And it's not just me, it's part of the team. Uh, and I think that would be a, a fun, fun dialogue. And so, Sean, thanks for the invitation. Sarah and Jessica, thanks for the wonderful ideas. Wonderful. And thank, no, thank the three of you for a, for a great conversation that I think we could easily span um, another two or three webinars out of this as well. What um, we do, just to summarize as well, what we end up doing um, at BTS Spark is we believe that, it, as Sarah was saying and Jessica was saying, it starts with that mindset um, and that leaders are critical. And if you really want to change your school and change the systems, you start by changing yourself. So we do have 
coaching programs that do focus on personal resilience that are available to individuals and small groups as well. The, all of these webinars um, are recorded and they do go up on our YouTube page, typically within 24 hours. Um, you can either Google our YouTube page. We do have the ones on messy leadership that I talked about, creating caring environments, new beginnings. Um, there's some really interesting um, and enjoyable webinars up there at the moment. But anybody that registered for this will get an email outlining um, when it goes up. And Sarah and Tom and Jessica, if you want to send me a link to any of your articles around this or assessments that you're recommending or maybe your latest books as well, please feel free to and we can uh, make sure that gets out into our audience's hands as well. So with that, um, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion, the three of you. We will not be having a webinar in January because of the holiday break. Our next webinar will be early February on leading change and you will be notified and hopefully you can make it as well. So with that, I hope you have a great holiday period and keep yourself safe and healthy and happy. Thank you.